Good evening and a very warm welcome to you wherever you are in the world to this How To Academy event on loneliness and the impact it can have on all of us. None of us are exempt. My name is Matt Stadler and I'm a presenter on LBC Leading Britain's Conversation. I'm delighted that this evening we're joined by a very special guest indeed, Dr Vivek Murphy, who is the former Surgeon General, no less, of the United States. Basically, the nation's doctor. And who wouldn't want Dr. Murphy to be their doctor? I certainly would. I'd feel reassured in your hands. He's written this brilliant book about loneliness. He actually wrote it before the pandemic, before the coronavirus crisis. But there is no better time than now to talk about loneliness and its effects. The book itself is called Together. And it's all about the healing power of human connection in a society that is sometimes very lonely, in a sometimes lonely world. It can be a very lonely world, as we'll, I'm sure, discover over the course of the next hour. I'll ask the questions that I think most appropriate. I have got some very recent experience of loneliness myself, but if I don't ask the questions that you'd like to have answered, then you can have a go at it yourself. So a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Murphy. Your family migrated from Huddersfield, I believe, when you were just one years old, back in 1978, and they made it to the freezing climate of Newfoundland, very different from the country of their birth, not perhaps so different from Yorkshire. And then they went on to, to Florida, but you have ended up, as I understand it, in, in Washington, perhaps not surprisingly, given your role that you held under Obama between 2014 and 2017, when Donald Trump allowed you to, to, to leave the post. So you were no longer, you didn't have to serve a Trump administration for too long, but we won't get too, too political unless you would like to. May I just start by asking you, before you sum up the book in, in brief synthesis, just what exactly it is to be the Surgeon General? I think probably here in Britain, where I am in London, we've become more familiar with the role because of this pandemic. So we're familiar with your successor but less familiar perhaps with what it entails. What, what does it mean? Well, first of all, it's great to be with you, Matthew. And uh, I do, in fact, trace my roots back to Huddersfield, <laughs> which uh, I had actually met very few people from Huddersfield after moving to the United States and growing up here. But since this book came out, I've actually been contacted by a number of people in the United States and around the world who trace their roots back to Huddersfield as well. So it's been a, it's been a wonderful and unexpected <laughs> uh, perk, actually, of, uh, of getting the book into the world. Uh, so it's great to be with you guys today. Um, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about the role of the Surgeon General, um, because it turns out most people in the United States have heard about the role, but even in the U.S., many people aren't familiar with what the Surgeon General actually does. Uh, but the Surgeon General has two roles uh, in the United States. The first is to provide the American public with the best possible information on health, scientific, evidence-based information, so people can make good decisions for themselves and their families. And that could be on anything from chronic illnesses, like tobacco-related disease and cancer and heart disease, to more urgent and immediate and newer threats, such as Zika and Ebola when I was in office, or like COVID-19, uh, as we're dealing with now as, as a planet. Uh, but there's a second role that the Surgeon General has, and that is to oversee one of the seven uniformed services in the U.S. government, the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which consists of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, pharmacists, and a host of other medical health professionals who each and every day work on strengthening the public health infrastructure of the country. But we also deploy these officers around the United States, in some cases around the world during times of emergency. So we sent hundreds of officers to Liberia during the Ebola outbreak to help provide medical care for those uh, who were at risk for Ebola or suspected of having Ebola. We also have deployed officers during hurricanes and tornadoes uh, after the uh, disaster of 9-11 and after many other uh, you know, challenges, public health challenges that the country has faced. So that, that is what the Surgeon General does. And because the Surgeon General is part of and heads up a uniform service, uh, the Surgeon General wears a uniform and carries the rank of a Vice Admiral, which is a common question uh, I often used to get um, when people would see me in uniform. That is at least when they weren't mistaking me for an airline pilot, which it turns out happened quite frequently in the airport. So. Not such a bad thing to be mistaken for. Perhaps in another life, we, we might meet in the, in, the middle of, in the middle of the air as we fly our different planes across the world, although we're flying 
so much less frequently now. As, as the, the, the general, the Surgeon General, you did really important work into addiction, looking, for example, at drug addiction and alcohol addiction. We're, we're focusing on loneliness today, partly because as in that role, you came across loneliness a lot of the time, but also as a doctor prior to that, and, and since, no doubt. And you've decided to write a book about it. So just tell us briefly, why did you write this book? And, and, and what is at its core? What, what's the big message that we can take away from it? Well, Matthew, this is not the book I expected to write. And it is uh, certainly another topic I thought I would be talking about uh, after I left the post. But the reason that this has come to pass, and the reason I ended up writing a book on this subject, is because I was really educated by the people I met all across the country about how profound a challenge loneliness is in not only in the United States, but really around the world, including in the UK. Uh, it turns out that uh, when I was Surgeon General, every community I went to, whether it was a small village or a larger town or a big city, uh, when I would hold town halls and go to you know, visit people and sit in their living rooms and talk to them about what was on their minds, that behind so many of the stories of addiction and violence and chronic illness and depression, were these threads of loneliness that I was finding. Um, people wouldn't often come up to me and say, hi, I'm Matthew, I'm Vivek, I'm lonely. But they would say things like, I feel I have to carry all of these burdens on my own. Or I feel if I disappear tomorrow, no one would even notice. Or I feel completely invisible. And hearing that time and time again from university students, from people in remote fishing villages in Alaska, from moms and dads, uh, from doctors and nurses, and even from members of Congress, the equivalent of our parliament uh, in here in the United States, it struck me that something deeper was going on. And in the months that followed, in the years uh, that, that came to pass, as I delved more deeply into the science around loneliness, I came to understand two critical things. One is that loneliness is exceedingly common, with more than 20% of the American population struggling with loneliness in terms of adults. And that's likely an underestimate but also with uh, nearly a quarter of UK and Australian residents uh, you know, endorsing loneliness and double digit percentages of many other uh, countries' populations around the world saying that loneliness is a problem for them. But I also realized second how consequential loneliness was. And it turns out that people who struggle with loneliness were at increased risk for heart disease, premature death, depression, anxiety, dementia, sleep disturbances, and on and on the list went. Uh, it's why I came to recognize also in this research that the mortality impact associated with loneliness is similar to the mortality impact associated with smoking 15 cigarettes a day, even greater than the mortality impact seen with obesity or sedentary living. So all of this convinced me that loneliness was both common and consequential. But the last thing I'll share about this is, is it, it, it struck me in the writing of this book, which I began, you know, because I was interested in loneliness, uh, it struck me along the way that social connection was a far greater resource for, for us and for as individuals and as society than I had fully realized. It turns out that social connection is a powerful tool, if you will, for improving our health, but also for enhancing our performance in the workplace and in school. And it even has powerful implications for our ability to dialogue with one another and to deal with and overcome the political polarization that has gripped so many countries around the world, including the United States, but I know has affected Britain and, and the UK more broadly as well. And so when you put this all together, what I came to realize is that if I wanted to do something about the front page issues that are affecting humanity today, whether that's chronic illness, or whether it's the struggles our kids are having in school, or whether it's a growing divide that seems to be affecting our population, that at the root cause of so many of that, much of that was actually strengthening social connection. So this book is really about the quest to build a people-centered life and a people-centered world, recognizing that our relationships with each other are the foundation on which we build everything else. It feels like we are waking up to loneliness as a huge problem in much the same way as perhaps we've finally been waking up to obesity. And there's an argument that we are enduring a loneliness epidemic on both sides of the Atlantic. And around about the, the same time, America seemed to be getting serious about this as an issue. We in this country, our government here, appointed the very first loneliness minister 
in 2018. Now we can talk about statistics, we can talk about the number of people affected and know that that will have skyrocketed during the pandemic. But one of the powerful things about the book is you choose to take individual stories to, to help us understand this narrative because it's, it's through the lens of the individual that we can often learn the most because we can empathize. You talk, for example, about Laura and Kendra and other people in, in, in the process, but it opens very powerfully with James and he's someone that you, you met, I think, quite early on in your, in your medical career. And, and he was someone, ironically, who had won the lottery, but as a result of this, had sort of cut himself off from important circles of connection and had become lonely. So he was telling you about his various physical ailments, but what struck you, and why I think you probably opened the book with it, was the loneliness. And that seemed to be at the heart of a lot of this. Just very briefly tell us his story and what we can learn from it. Well, James was someone I met very early in my medical training. And I remember when he walked into the clinic, one of the first things he said to me was, uh, doctor, I won the lottery and it was one of the worst things that ever happened to me. And I thought he was being figurative and that he was making, this is an elaborate metaphor, but he was being quite literal. Uh, but it turned out, you know, he was a, a baker and he worked in a bakery, uh, you know, in, in the nearby area. And before he won the lottery, you know, he, he didn't have a lot of money. He lived in a modest home uh, in uh, a, a lower middle class neighborhood, but he, he liked his neighbors and he came to work each day and was able to please his customers and like the people he worked with. But when he won the lottery, he figured, I don't need to work anymore. I don't need to live in a lower middle class neighborhood. So he quit his job. He moved to a community that was on the water into a very large, elegant uh, house. And in that neighborhood, everyone had large walls, you know, between their, their houses so that they would have privacy. And he found very quickly that he was profoundly alone. And this, uh, this, lap, this life that he thought he would live, which would be filled with luxury and where he would want nothing because he had all the money in the world, didn't seem to be quite as joyful as he thought it would be. And uh, you know, he found himself actually not only lonely, but increasingly angry and resentful soon after he developed diabetes and high blood pressure after putting on a fair amount of weight. And that's what ultimately brought him to see me. But one of the things that, and, that, that, that his story uh, really emphasizes to me and underscores, I think, in the book uh, is that society more broadly, modern society, uh, not just in the UK or the US, but around the world, has taught us that we find happiness in success and that we find success by acquiring one of three things, power, money, or fame. And the truth is our sense of self-worth also gets wrapped up in this. You know, we feel if we're not successful, if we're not wealthy, famous, or powerful, that somehow we haven't quite made it. We haven't done enough, that we're just not good enough as a result. And the reality, as James' story showed, but many other uh, stories have showed as well over the years, is that the acquisition of those three things, power, wealth, and fame, do not actually guarantee our happiness. In fact, the world is filled with rich, powerful, famous people who feel profoundly alone and quite unhappy as a result of that. And so that was an important lesson uh, that I was taught by James. But one last thing I'll say about his story, and this is a personal um, sort of regret of mine, is that I found that there he was talking to me about this profound loneliness he was experiencing, and I didn't know how to help him because I had not really been trained in medicine to think about loneliness. I didn't, I barely understood it uh, as a concept in terms of patient care. I understood it at a very deeply personal level because I had experienced it myself uh, for many, many years as a child growing up. But I didn't really know what to do in that context, sitting there in that moment in the clinic across the table from him. And I think of him often because I wish I had been able to serve him better. And as I think about our healthcare system, I think all of us, whether we're doctors or nurses or pharmacists, and frankly, even outside the healthcare profession, whether we're just members of the community, uh, you know, operating in schools or businesses, we all need to know what loneliness is, how to recognize it when it's there and how to respond because it is a profoundly human condition that affects all of us at some point in our lives. And just to build on the false gods of success or fame or your bank account or however it is that people so often seem to measure their lives these days. You met, as you say in the book as well, lots of people on their deathbeds and what they're preoccupied is not the size of their bank balance, it's not the status that they enjoyed or worried about. 
in society to, during their lives, but actually about the human relationships that they had formed along the way. No, that's absolutely right. And it, it was, I mean, a couple of things are striking to me about the people I met over the years in the hospital, so many things, but one of them was just how many people came in to the hospital uh, and were profoundly alone. And I mean that quite literally, they would come in by themselves and at critical moments when we had important diagnoses to talk to them about, or when we had something to discuss with them in terms of a new treatment option, uh, I would often go to them and say, is there somebody you want me to call? Uh, because I know this will be a, a tough discussion. Uh, anybody want me to call for support who can be here uh, while, we, while we have this conversation? They would often say, I wish there was somebody, but there isn't anyone. Uh, but with many of those patients, I was also privileged to have been with them in the final moments of their life, sitting by their bedside, holding their hand, listening to those final words uh, that they had to share uh, with me and those of us who happened to be present. And what was really striking to me, Matthew, is that very few of them talked about how famous they were or how many articles were written about them. They didn't talk about the last promotion they received uh, or about how many followers they had on social media. What they talked about in those final moments, when only the most meaningful threads of life remain, what they talked about were relationships, the ones that brought them great joy, the ones that broke their hearts, the ones they wish they had spent more time with. Because in the end, that's what matters most to us. When all of the noise settles, the signal, the, the point of light uh, that becomes most clear to us is our relationships. And the key that I took away from so many of those stories was that we don't have to wait until the end of our life to have that realization. We don't have to wait until the end to prioritize people and build a people-centered life. We can do that right now if we choose to recommit to the relationships in our life, if we choose to double down on human connection and center and build our life around that. Before we talk about, as it were, how we can help ourselves and the, the, the circles of relationships that you talk about in the book, the, the inner circle, the middle circle, and, and so forth. I just want to ask you a little bit more about that feeling you had when you were with James and no doubt other people, but you didn't as a doctor, you didn't as a physician quite know how to treat them. Is it possible to treat loneliness as a doctor, or is it only possible to treat some of the things that can go hand in hand with loneliness? So advertising, promoting this event, we say that loneliness can lead to anxiety, it can lead to depression, it can lead to addiction, it can lead to violence. Now you might know how to treat anxiety or depression, you might even know how to treat certain addictions. Can you treat loneliness in and of itself? It's a really good question. And I, I'm actually often hesitant to medicalize loneliness, to make people think of it uh, like some sort of disease that we need to develop a medication for and, um, and tell people this is what you have and you will have it for the rest of your lives. Um, it's not an identity and it's not necessarily an abnormality either. Loneliness is actually a natural feeling that all of us have at some point or another in our lives. Uh, sometimes for some people more often than others. But it's a natural signal our body sends us when we lack something we need for survival, which in this case is human connection. And in that sense, it's not uh, unlike hunger or thirst. You know, we, hunger or thirst, we don't think of as diseases, right? We know that if you feel hungry and thirsty and you don't satisfy that with nu nutrients or with water, and that goes on for a long period of time, that that can lead to complications, right? You can become dehydrated, you can become malnourished. It's the same with, with loneliness as well. Feeling lonely doesn't mean that you have a disease, but prolonged loneliness uh, can put you in a, in a protracted stress state, which in turn can increase in levels of inflammation in your body, and that in turn is associated with higher risk of heart disease and other chronic illnesses. But I think that there is a role that the healthcare system can play uh, in addressing loneliness. One is to help screen people for loneliness, you know, which we don't do right now, so we don't know who needs help. The second is to open conversations with patients about loneliness. The reason to do this is almost first and foremost to, to reduce the stigma and the shame around loneliness. When, you're, when you open a conversation and normalize uh, you know, a, a state such as loneliness, but the message you're sending to a patient, to somebody on the other side of the table, is that this is okay to talk about. This is common. Uh, many patients struggle with this. Uh, this is not something to be ashamed of. 
that in and of itself can be extraordinarily powerful. And from there, I don't think it's necessarily the healthcare system's sole responsibility to solve the problem of loneliness. But if we construct solutions well, what we can do is we can enable the healthcare sector to be a connector to organizations and the communities and others that can serve as a source of community and a source of connection. In the UK, in fact, um, there has been a lot of work done around what's called the social prescribing movement, uh, which is a larger effort to do just this, uh, to have healthcare systems set up so that they can connect people who are struggling with loneliness uh, to resources in their community. And in that way, the healthcare system can become an enabler, an empower, and, uh, and it can be a, a part of the larger solution that society has to provide. We have a sort of very powerfully inbuilt reaction to loneliness, to, just to continue some of what you've been saying. And I think neurologists, neuroscientists, have come together with anthropologists to help us better understand not so much the roots of loneliness, but just how we react to it. Because over, I don't think they've traced it back to 52 million years. And it is built into our system, isn't this hypervigilance, this reaction to loneliness as a response to, to isolation has become embedded in, in our nervous system so that that produces or can produce anxiety that we associate with loneliness. This, this, is, what I, this is my understanding of it. Anyway, you'll correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But, but in other words, this has been a problem for a long time. And it's as a result of that, our, our responses to it are very powerful. But I think as well that loneliness has become, as we've been talking about, much more of an issue recently and perhaps much more of a, a, an issue since the 19th century. We'll come to that as well. But just just if you could build on that for a moment, this idea that that we have something very powerfully inbuilt as a reaction against it. Well, it's absolutely the case. You know, loneliness is not a new phenomenon and our need for human connection is not new either. But that need is is a culmination of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of evolution, where as a species, we came to recognize that there truly was safety in numbers, and that when we were connected in trusted relationships, that we were better able to protect ourselves from predators, we were better able to share food and avoid starvation, we were better able to support one another with childcare and other responsibilities of life, which made the overall load more bearable. And when we were separated from our tribe, we automatically knew that our chances of survival had dropped. And that put us in a, in a stress state. But here is one of the, why this is actually so helpful, because it explains a paradox in how we react to loneliness in the modern world. Uh, because when in the thousands of years ago, when we were separated and we, we felt you know, threatened and we were moved into a stress state, our level of threat perception shifted as well. That meant that we were more likely to perceive something as a threat in that moment than we otherwise would have. The twig that cracked behind us, for example, which we might normally think was just you know, an, a harmless creature walking through the woods, we might suddenly think, wait, that could be a predator and we would be on high alert. And the reason we wanted to be in that state of hypervigilance is because our life very well may have depended on it. Uh, but transport now that reaction to the modern world, recognizing that while our circumstances are dramatically different, our nervous system is remarkably the same as it was thousands of years ago. So we re react to loneliness in a similar way that we did to being uh, you know, cut off from our tribe and wandering alone on the tundra. Uh, and in this moment though, in the modern world, when we react to loneliness with hypervigilance, when we're suspicious of those around us, when we're increasingly focused on self because we feel threatened and unsafe, then that actually makes it harder for us to interact with other people and to connect with others. It makes us actually, frankly, less appealing in terms of a conversational partner, for example. But it also, what we also find is that our self-esteem tends to erode over time as we experience loneliness because we start to believe that maybe the reason we're lonely is that we're not likable or we're broken in some way. And all of these forces combine to create a downward spiral where loneliness begets more loneliness. And so part of the solution to loneliness as we think about how to create a life of deeper connection is figuring out how to break that cycle and how to allow ourselves uh, to climb out of that and to once again open ourselves up to human connection. And it requires us to understand 
what the sort of possible implications of being lonely are or what the sort of things we might be led to do. So we might panic or, or look for comfort in food, just for example, and that can lead to obesity, a problem in itself, but it might create greater sense of loneliness and, and separateness, otherness. But also, I, I think by leading to anxiety and depression can end up entrenching us in where we are. So as someone who experiences anxiety episodically in my life, I'm very well aware of the sort of things I need to do to combat that. But I'm also instinctively someone, and I don't know whether this is true of lots of people who experience anxiety or not, but I'm instinctively someone who is able and able to reach out, able to understand if I'm feeling lonely or anxious that I need to speak to other people. During this pandemic, I've come across some male friends actually, who I would say are probably suffering from perhaps low level, if there is such a thing, depression. And what they are much less able to do or feel able to do is reach out. They, they, they don't instinctively call people. They, they withdraw and retreat further into themselves. And that can obviously make the situation worse. And hello to your little person there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. They will, uh, two little kids here. Oh, We're very sweet. Always excited to see what's going on <laughs> on the computer. Um, no, it's a really, it's a really good question, uh, a good point you're making. And if I could boil it down to, to one important root cause here, it's, it's the following. It's to think about loneliness as a form of pain. And, it, and this is the, the pain that I saw all across the country, deeper emotional pain uh, in people's stories that were stemming from and manifesting as loneliness. But as human beings, our instinct when we feel pain is to find a way to relieve it. And the question is, what do we reach for in those moments to reduce our pain? If we reach for the phone to pick up uh, you know, and dial a friend and to have a conversation with someone we love, if we get in the car and go visit uh, a family member, then we may find that our pain is lessened through the power of human connection. If we go for a run to help reduce our stress and clear our mind, that may help us as well. But if we reach for drugs or alcohol, if we reach for food, if we reach, if we throw ourselves more deeply into work as a way of dis, uh, distracting ourselves from that pain, all of that can actually be quite destructive to us. And, you know, being a workaholic is not, is a sociable, socially acceptable way uh, of dealing with your pain, but it's not necessarily a healthy one. And so in this way, what I was finding is that behind so many of the fundamental challenges that we were facing, including obesity, we're actually deeper sources of pain, which if not addressed, uh, we're gonna mean that we're, we wouldn't be able to really address a fundamental issue uh, that was in front of us. And it's in this way that I found that there was a broader theme emerging uh, as I was writing this book, which is that as human beings who are fundamentally social creatures, that's not to say we're all introverts, uh, but it's to say that we all need some, uh, or extroverts rather, but it's to say that we all need some degree of human connection in our life. As human beings who are fundamentally wired to connect. When we are deprived of our connection, it sends our systems haywire and it doesn't allow us to function uh, in the way that we were designed to function. Uh, that's why I think of social connection as, as essential to our well being and our survival as food and water. And just as the quality of the food and water matter, the quality of the relationships matter too. It's not just about how many people you're surrounded by, it's not just about how many people you have as followers on Twitter or friends on Facebook. It's not about how many people's phone numbers you have. It's about the number of people you have in your life who know you and appreciate you and value you for who you are, the kind of people you can approach and be yourself with, um, the kind of friends that you can actually enjoy and appreciate without having to wear a mask. And the truth is, Matthew, so many of us walk around in the world wearing a mask, trying to be who it is we think the world wants us to be and expects us to be. But all of that mask wearing, all of that time spent trying to be someone that we are not is exhausting. It's energetically draining. Uh, and ultimately, it leaves us feeling more lonely uh, than we otherwise would have been. Well, we don't attract the right sorts of people to us if we are wearing a mask because they're going to be attracted to the mask and not to what lies beneath the mask. So I think that's a very important point. We can come in a moment to, to life behind physical masks and, and, and the implications of how we move forward in this new world of ours at, at the moment. But I also want to pick up on something else you say in the, the book. It's, it's not just about the qualities of your friends 
and and how how well we interact with those that we that we love it's also it can be the importance of that casual interaction that that momentary exchange they can also help stave off loneliness it might be the way in which we talk to someone behind the counter in a shop if that is meaningful if that is done with love and i don't mean that in a sort of hippie happy happy sort of way i, I mean if we can really be genuine in the way we interact on a momentary level that actually has a more important and profound effect on our state of being and therefore on our sense of loneliness or otherwise than we might expect. Well, that's absolutely true. And, and there's some very interesting research that was done by, from the University of Michigan School of Business by Wayne Baker and Jane Dutton uh, on a concept of relational energy. And what they found is that when we have positive interactions with other people, whether that's an an old friend or a family member, or whether that's a stranger that we're just seeing for the first time. When those interactions are positive, when they're driven by a sense of generosity or kindness or empathy, then it actually creates something that Wayne and Jane called relational energy, positive relational energy. And what they found in their research, at least in the work setting, is that positive relational energy translates to engagement in the workplace, to greater productivity, greater creativity, and even greater retention. And so there is this notion, not just in the workplace, but even beyond, that our in positive interactions with other people, whether we've known them for a few seconds or for many years, does in fact have an impact on us. And I think part of the reason is that we are finely tuned organisms that are very well attuned to human connection and we're like sponges. When we have the ability to absorb and experience positive human connection, we react to it in the full force of our being. We react emotionally, we react physically with a surge of hormones in our body that actually make us feel good, lift our mood, and, and actually promote connection with the other person. But this is because I think we, as human beings, we are, in fact, a hardwired to connect. If you recognize this, then you start to see that the key to experiencing deeper human connection is in part in the relation, close relationships that we form with best friends and with spouses, but it's also in the other interactions we have, which as you pointed out, Matthew, have the power, the power uh, to be uplifting. And, and this is very much tied to something you alluded to in the beginning, Matthew, which is the, the different circles of relationships that we have, the inner, middle, middle and outer circles, which correspond in fact, at the different, three different types of loneliness that we can experience, intimate loneliness when we lack the closest friendships and spouse relationships with people who truly know us and accept us for who we are. It includes relational loneliness, which is when we lack friendships, uh, the kind of relationships we have with people with whom we may spend vacations or evenings or people we may hang out with on weekends. But it also includes collective loneliness, which is what we experience when we don't feel we have a group that we're part of, a sense of shared identity, that shared identity could, from, could come from a cause that we're part of in our community. It could come from a faith organization that we're part of. It could come from a job that we, uh, that we hold where we feel deeply wedded to the mission. But these three types of relationships are important for us to feel deeply connected. It's very interesting, this sense of collective loneliness and the opposite being co collectively, I suppose, to get togetherness, if that's not tautologist. And, and there's a big risk in a world of divisive, polarizing politics, a world of nationalism, a world that others a whole bunch of people and, says, and talks in terms of we and they. I mean, in talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, on my radio show in recent weeks, you have some people calling up and, and using the word they, when by they, they mean BAME, BAME communities, or specifically black communities, if such things exist anymore. And there's, in other words, there's a divisiveness. And I can imagine for Americans, for those who don't, didn't vote for Trump or who are appalled by his behavior, and I suppose this works, this could work the other way with a Democrat president as well, but there's something specific about the sort of politics that Trump seems deliberately to espouse and encourage, which is division, that you can get a, a sense of loneliness as a citizen. America and the American dream was built on the individual, but it was also built on this collective sense of identity, gathering behind the flag. We are all Americans, we're all in it together. And yet because of the, the way in which Trump encourages division, I can imagine a lot of Americans, and I don't just mean immigrant communities, 
I mean, people who subscribe to higher ideals, as I would see them, could feel some sort of collective aloneness or, or rather loneliness. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is a challenge in the US and in many countries around the world where what we are seeing is this, if you will, this othering uh, of, of groups of people, this phenomenon where certain communities, often because of the color of their skin, sometimes because of their religion, sometimes, frankly, because of their culture and ethnicity, are made to feel that they are less than, that they are unworthy, that they are the other. And in that circumstance, if you are the recipient uh, of, of that feeling, you can feel quite, quite lonely as a result. You know, as a child, actually, this is something I had felt. You know, I grew up, you know, largely in the United States, and you know, to, I was born to two parents who are from India, and um, I have brown skin, and I have a name that is clearly not a mainstream uh, American name in terms of how it sounds. Uh, it's a name of Indian origin, Vivek Murthy. Uh, and all of those things together somehow led me to feel like I was an outsider because as a child in elementary school, I was often made fun of for um, my heritage and for my, my name being you know, as unusual as it was or, or having darker colored skin. And you know, it, it was, I still remember how lonely that made me feel. And it wasn't just lonely like, oh, there's nobody like me. It's a sense of shame that came with it. And shame is a profound force in terms of making us feel more and more isolated and alone. Whether we are ashamed of an experience we had, whether we're ashamed of our background or our beliefs, whatever it is, shame isolates us and it deepens a feeling, a feeling of loneliness. And in this moment, as we think about what's happening to the world and in the world, when we make large swaths of people feel less than and unworthy, not necessarily even based on what we say, but based on our actions, on how we treat them. That can be deeply isolating uh, for many people in those communities. And especially for children, it can really chip away at their sense of self-esteem and how they even perceive of themselves. So th this is a moment I think where we, we have to more than ever confront those divisions and whether we are actively contributing to those divisions or whether we are passive bystanders, whether we're the perpetrators or the recipients, we have to recognize that this is a moment where we have to somehow change the trajectory uh, of that division. And I think that the way in part that we do that is we start getting close to other people's lives. We start opening our ears to listen and understand what they're going through. We start opening our hearts to recognize the common threads and shared struggles and common values that we hold with people who may look, sound, and appear different from us, but who are in fact quite similar uh, to us. You know, when Nelson Mandela and others were trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces uh, in South Africa and rebuild a community that could function and truly heal, because it's not just about functioning, it's about healing, right? It's about being as healthy and as strong as we can be together. What they realized had to happen was a truth and reconciliation process. They recognized that you couldn't just pass laws and ensure that people function together. You couldn't just throw people in the same room and assume that they would find some way to get along. But there had to be a very intentional process by which people could tell their stories, by which they could be heard and seen and understood. Because as human beings, Matthew, we all have these three core needs. We all want to be seen for who we are. We all want to know that we matter and we all want to be loved. And one of the most powerful things that can happen when you listen to someone, when you give them the gift of your full attention, when you're fully present with them, is you can meet all three of those needs actually in that moment. And in, as we think about how to deal with the scourge of racism in our countries and around the world, they cannot happen unless we have a truth and reconciliation process like that, unless we are in our own lives, finding ways to pause, to listen deeply, to understand other people's stories, uh, and to do that on a very personal level, not just by reading it in books, not just by hearing stories on the radio, but by meeting people face to face and by connecting deeply and directly with their humanity. That's what the power of human relationships can do, is they can transform lives, they can transform society. And 
I never imagined when I wrote this book that we would be in the midst of the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice. Um, you know, one has hit us more recently, the other has been there for a long time, but has reared its head once again with great wrath. And we're seeing and bearing the, the brunt of that in this moment once again, but I would never have imagined that in this moment, we would be experiencing both, but it turns out that the, the solution to both still comes back to the power of human connection and thinking about how do we cultivate our relationships with one another, recognizing that it, when we have relationships with others, then we're actually able to listen to them. When we can listen to other people, we can dialogue. When we dialogue, we can actually overcome our divides and come together to address big problems like racism, climate change, and our struggles with structural inequality. But you can't do that if you don't fundamentally have some basis of connection with someone else. If you've never had a conversation with someone who's unlike you, if you've never stopped to understand their point of view and, and their life experience. Um, that's why in the United States, I think one of the things we need is we need compulsory public service here in the country. Not to say everyone needs to go into the military, although those who, who would like to per serve in that way, I think are obviously more than welcome to, and I think that that's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary act of service. But we need other opportunities as well in which people come together around our country and serve, whether it's in the military or in schools or in underserved neighborhoods, but where they come together to serve. Um, that's what the world needs. And this is why I found in the writing of this book, one of the unexpected things is that service, it turns out, is a powerful antidote to loneliness. Uh, because when we serve others, we actually break that negative cycle we spoke about earlier. We shift our attention from ourselves to someone else in the context of a positive interaction. We reaffirm to ourselves that we have value to bring to the world. And in doing so, we forge stronger connections than we otherwise may have formed. In a way, you've, you've partly answered or substantially answered the question I, I want to ask you about to what extent loneliness is, as it were, solvable by shifts in public policy. So there's a piece in the, in the New Yorker recently, which actually mentioned your book, uh, amongst others, and it talked about loneliness not really existing before the 19th century. I mentioned the 19th century earlier because people really needed others to survive in those days, goes the argument. It talks then about the politics and philosophy of individualization, that people now live alone partly out of choice. And that before the 20th century, I imagine they were speaking about America here, I think 5% of households, which amounted to 1% of the population, were one person households. Whereas the number has ex exploded since then. Is there an extent to which we are now, as, as it were, culturally entrenched in loneliness that, that is beyond, therefore, the reach of policy? I mean, how powerful can our politicians be in helping us move away from this epidemic if it is one? It's a good question, Matthew. I think if we really want to address loneliness, we have to understand what you just said, which is that loneliness is fed by our culture, by the structure of society, by how we use technology, as well as by other elements like increased mobility today, which have incredible conveniences and benefits, but sometimes come at a cost of moving us away from communities that we've come to know and love. But I actually think this to solve loneliness, we actually need to operate on three critical levels. We need individual solutions, we need institutional action, and we do need governmental leadership. And here's actually what government can do uh, that is hard to replicate in the private sector. Government can put a spotlight on an issue and say, this is an issue that's of national importance uh, to the country. It's what the UK did, in fact, when you appointed uh, several years ago uh, a Minister of Loneliness, Tracy Crouch, right? And that's something that government, only really government can do in that way. Government can also bring together resources to invest in research to help us better understand what's driving loneliness and how to address it. It can help build a national strategy uh, for loneliness, which uh, Minister Crouch and her successors, you know, have, have worked on as well. Diana Barron now, I think. Yes. So there's, there is an important role for government to play that cannot be replaced. But there are also important roles that the institution and the individual must play, because the government alone is not going to solve loneliness, right? 
but institutions have to think about how to build workplaces to strengthen human connection. How do we design schools and curricula that give our children the foundation for healthy relationships from the youngest of ages? And as individuals, this is where it all starts. It starts with us, number one, recognizing the importance and power of human connection in our lives. It involves us recognizing that to truly build a people-centered society, we have to start with building a people-centered life ourselves, which means prioritizing our relationships with where we put our time, our focus, and attention. It means prioritizing relationships and what we choose to speak up about in the public square. And it also means putting relationships and human values first, even when we go to the ballot box and think about who we vote for. You know, one of the things that concerns me, Matthew, is when I hear people say, you know, I don't like such and such a candidate, but I'm going to vote for him or her uh, because uh, I like their tax policy, or I think that their economic policies are, are the right ones, but I really don't agree with their values, I just, but I do like this particular policy. You know, leaders, elected leaders, 90% of the decisions they make are ones that we will never see. We have to trust what's guiding them in those moments. And what's guiding them are often their values. And what we need are elected leaders who are firmly grounded in human values, who understand that when we strengthen relationships with each other, when we lead with kindness, generosity, compassion, that this, these values are what enable us to create policies that work for everyone. They would allow us to set examples for our children uh, and for others. And so in all of these ways, to lead a people-centered life is to lead with human values. And that needs to be reflected in how we design all parts of our life. And if we do all do this collectively, working at the individual institutional and governmental level, then we will start to build the constructs and the supports that we need to truly create the deep connection that I think all of us crave in our lives. Because we've moved beyond in, in Western cultures or in some Western cultures, perhaps less so in, in, in Italy, but in America and, and Britain, certainly, we move beyond the intergenerational family. We, we, have, we focus on the, on the nuclear family to the extent that we focus on family at all. As I understand it, again, according to that piece in The New Yorker, in places like India and China, lo loneliness or, or, or rather people living alone is now on the increase. Now, in India and Pakistan, both countries I've visited, there's been a huge emphasis traditionally on that intergenerational family. So if those societies start to move away from them, they perhaps can expect a, a, a rise in loneliness as well. And yet in the book, you talk very helpfully about the family of families. And it, it, these are the families that, that, we, that, that we don't live with necessarily, but th that we choose, that we're not born into, but that we create by our actions. And, and you give us an example, when you were woken up as a, a seven-year-old by your mother dragging you out of your bed, your, your father himself was a, 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 an important doctor in his community. And you were going to visit someone, I think, maybe they were living in a caravan, I can't remember, but you were going to go and visit someone who had just, just that moment been widowed. She'd lost her husband and she was desperate with grief. And it, loneliness, of course, can be a sort of form of, of grief, can't it? We can grieve our own loneliness. But in that case, she was grieving the, the immediate loss of her husband. And your mother, still dressed, I think, in traditional Indian dress, just hugged this woman as she was sobbing her heart out. And that was creating a family, wasn't it? So if we're talking about cures, you mentioned earlier how it can help us to help others, but we can create families beyond our own family. We absolutely can. And I think in traditional societies like that, which my mother and father grew up in in India, where your family was largely structured for you, it was your parents and your siblings, but also your extended family, your neighbors often who had lived there for generations next to your family. That was largely structured for you. But in the modern world where people move around and they leave those communities behind, where the extended family has become much less common, we have to think about how to build the family that we need, whether we're biologically related to them or not. And one of the things that has struck me uh, in reflecting on this topic and in just talking to so many people around the world and there's how they built a connected life is that we can, in fact, build these kind of connections if we're willing to extend ourselves uh, to others uh, with warmth and with compassion and with generosity. If we seek others out uh, with an intent to serve, 
uh, as opposed to just an intent to receive. We can build these connections. It's what I saw in my parents' own life. You know, my mother and father, when we moved to Miami, Florida, they set up a medical practice where my sister and I would just hang out all the time and we would observe them taking care of patients and seeing patients come looking stressed and anxious. And then we would watch them leave looking more reassured that they had a partner in their healing. And my parents keep in mind, you know, were not born in the United States. They were raised in another country. They looked different. They sounded uh, different. They, their life experience was completely different, but to the people that they served, they were family. And that's how they looked at the, that their patients and their families as well. And that's why on that night, when my mother woke me up to take me uh, with my sister and my father to that trailer park in Miami in the middle in the dead of night, she was doing so because one of their patients, Gordon, had passed away after a long struggle with metastatic cancer. And they knew that his wife, Ruth, would be grieving alone, and they were worried about her. And so that's why they took us out there. It's not because it was in their job description. It's not because they were billing for it and getting paid. It was because they realized that community matters and that none of us can survive alone, but we have to be there to take care of each other. That's how we build a family of families. And that's, I think, what we're called to do now in modern society. So I want to bring in questions from the audience. And just before I do so, and, and briefly, although it's an important question, we've only just touched on technology a little earlier. Technology has helped keep us connected during this pandemic. It's been a lifeline for huge numbers of people. And, and I wonder how we fit technology into our lives moving forward. Clearly, to some extent, that is going to depend on how the pandemic plays out. But there is an argument to say that too much online connectivity can create loneliness. If we spend too much time on social networks, on Instagram and Twitter and so forth, we can actually begin to isolate ourselves. And we can isolate ourselves from our relationships that way, from our marriages and so forth. So how do we get the balance right in terms of our use of online technologies to keep us connected? Well, that's such an important question. And I know that Many people are asking about that in, in the Q&A. And I'll just say that this is perhaps the most common question that I've gotten as I've uh, traveled and talked about loneliness is, is it due to technology? And so there are a couple of things to say here. One is that technology itself is a tool and it is how we use it that determines whether it strengthens our connection or weakens our connection. Now, obviously now during COVID-19, technology has become a lifeline for so many of us to stay connected to others. But here's where it lo we can run into problems with technology. When we use it uh, to such an extent uh, that it actually crowds out in-person interaction, such as if we're, for example, constantly texting uh, with friends and constantly on social media, and that's where our time is going is instead of actually seeing people one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face in groups, then that can actually dilute the quality of our interactions with others. The second, is if we allow technology to invade the space of our interactions, if, it, if we allow it to distract us when we're having conversations with others, as often happens when we bring our phone to the dining table or to the table in a restaurant when we're catching up with a friend, then it can dilute the quality of our relationships as well. And if you've ever been like me and you have been on the phone catching up with a friend and found yourself somehow on Instagram all of a sudden or checking your inbox or Googling a question that popped into your head or looking at the, the score for the football game you know, or the basketball game, then you know that this is very easy to do, to fall into that mode of, of multitasking because we convince ourselves we can do it. We can still pay attention to our friend, but the science is very clear, we can't. We actually task switch when we think we multitask. And so that's another way in which we can run into trouble with tech. But there's a third and perhaps more, more insidious way, which is that one of the things that social media in particular does but that the sort of constantly connected uh, environment does as well, is it accelerates dramatically the culture of comparison that already existed in society, like pre-smartphone, pre-internet. And that is really problematic because the message that young people in particular are getting, but really all of us, uh, as we look at people's idealized lives and perfectly curated pictures on social media, the message we get is that we're not good enough it's that we're not thin enough, we're not fun enough, we're not good looking enough, we're not popular enough, we're not rich enough. Whatever it might be, the message continues to come that we're not enough. 
And that can be particularly destructive for young people who are forming their own sense of identity. And you might ask, well, why does their feeling about themselves matter for them to connect to other people? And here's why it matters, is when we approach other people from a place of being grounded and centered, from a place of knowing our worth and our value, then we're more able to listen to them. We're more able to show up as ourselves authentically in conversation. And the connections that we forge are often stronger. And that, so that's why this sense of self, our connection to self really matters in connecting to others. But here are some ways we can use technology to help us. You know, if we are using technology, like video conferencing technology in particular, so we can see people's face and appreciate the tone of their voice and hear the content, obviously, of their words. And if we can focus on that conversation in front of us, then technology can actually be a lifeline, especially in a moment like this when our we are so restricted from seeing each other in person. If we can use technology to ensure that we're spending at least 15 minutes a day connected with other people, recognizing that 15 minutes may be a small time, but it can be a powerful, powerful gift to help us feel more connected and to lift our mood when we're doing consistently over time. So if we're focusing on the quantity of time and the quality of time through technology, then what, we can, what we'll find is that tech can in fact be a source uh, of strengthening our, our relationship. But it all comes down to, to how we use it and finally to drawing boundaries, right? So if we aren't drawing boundaries around where we allow technology to invade our lives, if we're, for example, allowing it to come to the dinner table and to invade all of our conversations, then we're never gonna be able to fully focus uh, on other people. And it's really, really important that we do so if we wanna cultivate high, you know, high value connections. You know, last thing I'll say about technology is this. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on how much time kids spend on technology. And, and they, they do spend a lot of time on technology. In fact, we know from actually from some very interesting work done at Oxford uh, that people, when, when kids are on online somewhere between one to two hours a day, that seems to be where they optimize uh, their well being. But kids spend many, many more hours than that in front of screens on a normal basis. But what matter, may matter just as much as how much screen time they have is the quality and the nature of that screen time usage. So for example, if your child is on, in front of a screen for an hour uh, because they are watching, let's say, a movie with you and with their siblings, and you're all talking about the movie and discussing it and reflecting on your own lives, that could be far more beneficial than even just five minutes spent on YouTube watching a video that makes you feel terrible about yourself because it's all uh, about how it maybe it's all about maybe framing an image you know around your body or around your popularity uh, that may be different uh, from what that child may be experiencing in that moment and so it's the quality of the interaction on tech that matters as well and so i think about this a lot as a parent of a three and two year old um, and i can see just how they are attracted uh, to to technology so quickly because these devices are designed to, to really pull them in. But making sure that we're interacting on tech together with our children, that we're using technology to connect uh, and have high quality conversations with others, these are some of the ways in which we can use tech to strengthen connection instead of weaken it. Not everyone who lives alone, of course, is lonely. And, and loneliness is not necessarily the same thing as solitude. Solitude can be something that we that we welcome but but equally if you do uh, are lucky enough as most of us are to have a, a roof over your head that that doesn't necessarily mean you don't feel lonely i mean you can even feel lonely as we know inside a relationship children can feel lonely inside their family structures and ursula wants to know specifically here how can you notice that a child is lonely well, it's a really good question. And loneliness is in part hard to recognize because number one, there's tremendous shame around it. So people won't open up. I never told my parents, for example, that I was struggling with loneliness despite all of those years uh, of pain and hardship. So that's one reason. But it, the other reason it's hard to see is because I think of it as a great masquerader. Sometimes loneliness doesn't always look like somebody sitting in the corner of a room alone during a party, but it can show up as irritability and anger, as it often does uh, among men. Uh, it can show up as withdrawal, which might be paradoxical. You might think, well, if someone's lonely, shouldn't they want to go out and interact? But because of that negative downward spiral of loneliness, people can often retract even further into their shell. 
Um, loneliness can look like depression. It can look like anxiety as well. So it's not always easy to notice. But one of the things I think that's important to, to do as a parent is, is to try to understand, uh, number one, does your child have uh, healthy interactions with people in person, either in school or outside of school, uh, peers in particular? Uh, the second is to understand um, how your child how your child feels about themselves. You know, do they feel that they are that they're good enough? Do they feel like they are of interest to other people, or do they instead say, oh, nobody wants to hang out with me. I'm not very interesting. I'm not very popular. Uh, I'm not really good looking. Nobody wants to spend time with me." Um, if they're giving you the latter kind of answer, that's a, a clue that they may in fact be a greater risk of loneliness. Uh, and the finally, I'd say the other thing to look at uh, with your child is to, just to recognize that your children, all of our children, they learn from us as their parents. Uh, as, well, as one friend told me before I had my, uh, my first child, they said, your children may sometimes listen to what you say, but they'll often listen to what you do. And so they will learn by your example. And so as we design our own lives, uh, we should remember that how connected a life we live how we prioritize relationships, how we put people first will influence what our children choose to do as well. And if we use our own lives, in fact, and if we open up and share with our children about our own uh, struggles at times and about our own efforts to build a more connected life, we can open, create opportunities to actually talk about their own connection in their life. And the truth is many kids want to talk about these issues with their parents, but they're embarrassed to. Uh, they don't know how to start that conversation, uh, and they need, they need a parent often to, to get that started. And by sharing a little bit about your own life, you can create a safer environment for them to be more vulnerable. Some more questions from the Q&A, and if you're able just to answer them very briefly, we'll rattle through them because there's some really good ones. Sure. So Molly wants to know, do you think people living in bigger cities such as London and New York are more prone to feeling lonely, and if so, why? I think they often can be because there's a, in these big cities, people lead such busy lives, such hyper scheduled lives that they often don't have time for each other for random interactions and, and engagements. So I think people can often feel like small fish in a big pond and that's very, very lonely. Joanne says, how can I deal with my anxiety and depression, depression issues? I have problems with my ears, she says, and they have caused me a lot of anxiety and depression over the over the years. That's from Joanne. And of course, we were talking about how loneliness can lead to anxiety and depression, but presumably depression and anxiety can lead to loneliness. Yeah, well, first, Joanne, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your struggles with anxiety and depression. You are certainly not alone. Uh, many, many people uh, struggle with the same. What I would say is that uh, even if your anxiety and depression are independent of loneliness in terms of where they originated, social connection can help assuage some of the pain that comes from loneliness and I mean, from anxiety and depression as well. And so even though it's hard, the efforts that we make to reach out to friends to tell them, hey, uh, I'm, I'm struggling and this is something I've been dealing with for a while, I need you to check on me from time to time. That actually can be an invaluable thing to do. I've seen many people who struggle with depression and anxiety do that because it's hard in the throes uh, of an episode to actually reach out to somebody. But if you tell your friends in advance, that you need them to check in on you. Many of them will do that. And I'd lastly, also say on this, say service is extraordinarily powerful here as well. It can be hard sometimes when you're feeling depressed and anxious to just go to a party and or go to a friend's house and hang out with a bunch of people. But sometimes service can be an easier way to engage. Uh, and whether that service is uh, volunteering at a, at, a, at a soup kitchen or organization or community, whether that's checking in on a neighbor to make sure that they're doing okay uh, or sending uh, a gift or some food to a coworker who may be struggling to telework while they're homeschooling their children. These are small acts of service, uh, which can help strengthen our sense of connection and our sense of self. We're not always aware of people who are struggling with extreme feelings, with loneliness, with, with depression and so forth. Not that they always manifest as extreme. And this anonymous attendee says, I've been lonely since childhood, despite being friendly, optimistic, I've never managed to retain long-term friendships. I'm confident around people and have a good job. No one would ever know how often I have suicidal thoughts. What am I doing wrong? It's a difficult question to answer very briefly, but I wanted to acknowledge it and also to say that loneliness can lead people not to understand that they're, that they're not alone in their loneliness. 
that so many people in the world suffer from loneliness. It is important for people to, who, who experience depression, anxiety, loneliness to realize that they aren't alone in that. That is absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, we know both based on hard data and on stories that millions and millions of people struggle with loneliness, with feelings of being inadequate and with feelings of hopelessness. Uh, but what we also know uh, is that when they are able to access help and when they are able to build social connection in their life, uh, that the pain eases and that they can in fact do better. Uh, here in the US and the UK, I know that we have helplines available for those who are struggling. In the US, we have a national helpline, our, our National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. I know there's a similar number in the UK as well. Um, just repeat I, that. Would you just repeat that number for people? Sure. In the US, it's 1-800-273-8255. And in, um, by dialing this number, 800-273-8255, you can speak with a counselor uh, who can help you, especially when you're in the throes uh, of that deep pain. Uh, which so many people struggling with depression and anxiety can feel. Um, so there is help available, but I also, it's so important for you to know that there, you are not alone and that there's no shame also in what you're experiencing. Some of the most uh, people, successful people is deemed by sort of traditional standards. People we hold up to be extraordinarily successful who we think have no problems in life struggle with anxiety and depression. I know this because I know many of them. I've talked to many of them and they feel ashamed about their struggles. And it's, that's a great irony is that so many of us are struggling alone, thinking that we're the only ones, not recognizing that many of us are in fact in the same boat. We, we talked a little earlier about attitudes to loneliness or the experience of loneliness in the Western world and in other parts of the world. Is there a difference, this anonymous attendee asks, in self-reported loneliness levels in developed nations against developing nations? It's a great question. Self-reported loneliness is always challenging because loneliness itself has cultural overlays and nuances. And my father, for example, didn't really even, I found it hard to even understand the concept of loneliness because he'd never experienced it as a child growing up in a very extended family environment with tons of community support, even though they were very, very poor. Um, so there is a cultural overlay here, which I think affects how people answer these questions. There's also a lot of stigma around loneliness, which prevents people from admitting. Even to themselves, often they have loneliness. So you have to look at survey data, um, and we're recognizing that many of the numbers you see may in fact be under counts. Um, but there are some good scales that in fact are used to measure loneliness, the, the John Gerville scale, the UCLA loneliness scale, and others which have been validated. But we do know that the nature of a society and its culture affect uh, how lonely people are. And I worry that in modern society, one of the things that we have lost uh, is a focus on social structures that catch people, that help them feel like they're part of something, and that give them the community that all of us desperately need. I just want to finish by asking you what advice you'd give people very generally. And we know that loneliness comes in different shapes and forms and affects all of us, that affects us at different parts of our different times in our, in our life. And there are plenty of people who are still shielding basically in, in this country who haven't seen people in some cases for a very long time, although we hope that the restrictions will begin to ease and expect them to do so. We remember those people as we go out and about increasingly into society. But generally, if you can, in synopsis, what, what advice would you give people during this pandemic to, to, to try to be as unlonely as possible? Well, first, let me just say, Matthew, this is, it's been a privilege to be able to talk to you about this subject and to, to be with everyone here who joined. Um, you know, what I want to say just in closing is that this subject of, of loneliness and social connection, I believe, is at the heart of what we need to address to create a stronger, healthier, and more resilient world. And it starts with the actions that we take in our everyday life. Uh, do we choose to prioritize people in where we spend our time, where we give our attention, where we devote our energy? Uh, do we choose to prioritize relationships as we're making big decisions about our career and about our family? Uh, these are simple things to say. They're a lot harder to do. And they're hard to do because many, many times the, the world around us may not approve of or give us credit, if you will, or lift up the choices we make that prioritize people. Um, but what we know 
from the stories of so many, especially those at the end of life, is that the decisions we make to, to really prioritize those relationships are the ones that bring the greatest joy to our lives. Uh, you know, when I think about the experiences that I had and the privilege uh, that I had to listen to so many stories that went into this book, uh, they leave me with a simple credo, a credo that I would say represents the core message of this book, the core solution, if you will, to building a more connected world. And that's just three words. It's to put people first, put people first. And if we think about that, that can be the recipe that guides us in the decisions we make in our lives, but it can also be the philosophy that guides us in how we design workplaces and schools. It can be what informs our government as it shapes policies that inevitably affect our relationships and society more broadly, but which we rarely track or think more deeply about. But if we're able to put people first in our decisions at all levels as individuals, institutions, and as a government and as a world, then I think that we can rebuild the infrastructure that we need to take on big problems, to come together and create a politics that actually works, to ensure that we have not only better physical health, a greater mental health uh, in ourselves and in our children. And, you know, as a dad, you know, as a parent who wants the best for his kids, which wants, who wants his kids to inherit, or inherit a world that's full of promise, full of hope, full of compassion and love. I know that there are a few things that are more important than building this kind of people-centered focus. Because to build a people-centered life and a people-centered world is fundamentally about living a life that's in accordance with human values. And human values to me are largely centered around love and the feelings that come from that. You know, love informs generosity and compassion and kindness. And when we make decisions that are driven by love, we often feel better about them. We often strengthen our relationships in the process. But when we make decisions that are driven by fear, which is the opposite of love, decisions that are driven by jealousy or anger or insecurity, then we often hurt our relationships with ourselves and others, and we lead uh, to a result that's often unfavorable. And that's the struggle that the world is in right now. The world is gripped and, and locked in this deep struggle between love and fear. And it is up to us and the decisions that we make to tip those scales away from fear and towards love and to do it by the actions that we take, by the words that we speak, by the issues that we choose to raise up in the public square using our voice. And so that's my hope coming out of this, is that all of us will recognize the extraordinary power that we have to put people first and build deeper connections in our life and the lives of others. And if we do that, if we lead with love in how we design our lives, we will create the kind of world that we need and that our children deserve. Well, you speak incredibly powerfully Dr. Vivek Murthy, it's been a great privilege actually to spend the last hour or so with you. Thank you for giving us so much time. It's, it's rather moving actually for someone who is, I think you're still only 42 years old, two years older than me, and has already been the Surgeon General of the United States to de-emphasize, as it were, traditional success and to talk about the importance of human connection, relationships, families of families, choosing kindness and love over the opposite. It's, it's been very, very moving. It's been powerful. It's been, as I say, a pleasure and a privilege to spend this time with you. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in as well to this How To Academy event. I hope it has been in some way helpful. The Samaritans line, by the way, for those of you living in the UK and perhaps in Ireland as well, I'm not sure, is 116123. That's 116123 if you've been affected by anything we've been talking about. And that's free to call and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you to all of you for joining us. I'll be back on Wednesday with How To Academy with an event with the legendary broadcaster, John Snow of Channel 4 News. That's at three in the afternoon. I do hope you'll be able to join me for that. Once again, Dr. Murphy, thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you. Take care. You too.